was speaking. First was the girlish voice, Melegans, who wriggled his body like an Arabian belly dancer, nervous as a nightingale. Then followed Anetus. His claim to distinction was his large, floppy ears and hairy nostrils. Last to follow was Lycon, he of the narrow temples and the dull eyes. The 500 eminent Athenians who were acting as a jury were sitting on the floor in a wide concentric circles. Some of them were half lying back with their legs crossed chewing on roasted marrow seeds, the husks of which they spat out onto the back of the necks of the jurors sitting in front of them. Others were using their sandals as pillows, lying fully stretched out on the ground, fast asleep. Socrates was sitting in a dock. He was staring up at the sky. It was a pale blue sky, unique and unsurpassed, a colour particular to the Athenian sky. Now and then, he rubbed his left knee, which troubled him with twinges of pain. Throughout all the bitterness and hatred stirred up against him, Socrates remained undisturbed. He just stared up at the sky, listening to the birds chirping, watching them darting from one tree to the other, until he too, eventually fell asleep. Psst, psst, master, master, mm. master, it's your turn to speak, mm. speak. Uh, what time is it? No. Oh, in past Do you mean there's been six hours of talking and I haven't heard a thing? Obviously, old age has affected my hearing. Shame that um, Ulysses never had my affliction. You know, Ulysses, he stuffed wax in his ears and tied himself to the mast to avoid death's hedonistic song. I do believe it would strain to his soul. Only for the rest of his days, poor bastard. <laughs> Look at all these amazing people. I feel like I'm in Hades, yeah. I feel like I'm in Hades, surrounded by 500 Putins. Oh, I'm not laughing, I'm not laughing. I'm in awe, suffering from fear, confusion and stupidity. You see, my stomach's turning over and I have this patriotic instinct. You see, I too have these three virtues of fear, confusion and stupidity. And wherever they take hold, oh, oh. mark my, my words, law and order are secure and the people I'm happy. My mind isn't what it used to be. Uh, it used to go to these far and exotic places. So far, no fish nor fowl could ever reach there. It was the land of ideas. And whoever should set foot in there shall suffer Therese's his fate when he was struck forever blind, <laughs> when he saw Pallas Athena start naked. I 
didn't hear a song of what you said. <laughs> Some of your insults and your vile ejaculations. <laughs> and I tried to sit there, just trying to work out the kind of put downs or, or replies that I can give you, but I couldn't. You see, you're not allowed to interrupt an orator when they're in full flow. It's against the law. So I sat there, frustrated as hell. It's like, like on a cold winter's night when you're wrapped up in a nice warm blanket, you're dying to go for a pee. <laughs> but the, by, by the time I got to the point of me replying, I forgot what I had to say. And I couldn't be bothered to remember. Now, but what I do remember is the verdict. <laughs> the death sentence. Oh, I knew it was coming. I had full faith in the degradation of our time. Oh, yeah. And what else, what other verdict could you give? I mean, look at you. I mean, really look at you. I mean, half of you are asleep, and the other half can't wait to get home to their wives and their mistresses. And even if you were, were awake, and you listened and attentive and sitting at the edge of your seat, listening to every single word and syllable, the verdict would have been the same. Know why? Look at my accusers. These fine, outstanding men of democracy, pillars of the state. And then look at me. <laughs> I mean, look at me. Ugly, erring down, filthy, dirty, smelly, and foul mouth. But the wisest of all. Where can I hide? No, come on, tell me. Where can I hide? Maybe the earth opened up and swallowed me. The truth be told, if I was in your shoes, I would have given the same verdict. In fact, I would have gone a stage further. I would have given myself the cat and nine tail as well. And I would have considered both a punishment and honour. But the thing, the thing that I can't really understand is why these fine, handsome young men asked for my death sentence. Now, was it for the good of the states? Hmm. Or maybe, maybe it's to sell my property off cheaply, uh, which I don't have. Or maybe he was to, to blackmail me for cash, again, which I don't have, to suppress the summons. Or maybe, ah, maybe one of the three of them worried, wanted to bury my wife's son, Phippi, on my death. Well, all I can say is good luck to them. <laughs> no. The reason they asked for my downfall is to save your soul's virtue, which is a bit rickety. Because let me tell you, if they weren't so good and honest, they would be in the dock and I would be the prosecutor. Listen to what they say about me. He lies around all day in the marketplace, interfering with people who are going about their business. He blames everybody else for his own problems. And then he brags about that he doesn't charge for his teachings. The audacity of the man. All I know is today, today he gets his just desserts. And well, tomorrow, We'll be neither richer nor poorer, but a pain less in their name. Oh, men of Athens, our oh, men of Athens. You see, a, a scarecrows as true men, and winds as gods. When I see men as scarecrows, and gods as which you dream. But I see, I see. Now realize that all the people around me are just testing, so that the only reason for their existence is to die. I never took myself too seriously. I made fun of you openly and myself secretly, not caring about yesterday, today, tomorrow, or even death itself. I'm not gone upon her to fray you with a sharp thing. No! Oh, I'm a midwife, son. The consul is the movement I use the uh, irony, wisdom. Not that they did you not much, did no. In fact, I knew then that you were going to kill me. I who knows nothing. Therefore, whatever I know is not worth a thing. I didn't even write it down. And even if I did, what would you have done, eh? You would just burnt it like you did Pythagoras' books. Look, just do with me what you will. Even if you left the prison gates open, I wouldn't have used them. What for? To live another year, another day?
Why well, I never trumps some few people my wife? Why well, I never beat her? It's quite simple, really. She was right. <laughs> what kind of a husband was I? I used to get up in the morning and go off and gallop out with my rich friends. While well, she stayed at home looking after the house, the animals, uh, the vines, the olive trees, the children. Oh, the children. Oh, I've got to tell you. She, you would have been very proud how she brought up the children. Oh, yes. If they fought or argued or even stole apples from the local orchard, she never used to tell them off. No. The minute they tripped up and ripped their clothes, boy, did she give them off for. Don't you become my uncle for loving father? <laughs> even when she used to go and draw water from the well. All the women used to give her a wide berth to avoid her acid tongue and her sharp nails. <laughs> if I didn't do it after her, <laughs> when I was 60 years young, I took myself another wife. Her name was Mitra. Oh, she was beautiful. Straight from her mother's bosom. <sighs> she was the granddaughter of Alistair, the just. A fine man, a very fine man. Oh, yes. Before I know it, she bore me two sons. The problem was, something we couldn't stand the sight of her. She used to pull her hair, fight with her, and starve the poor girl to death. Before I know it, she lost all her looks, very young. I couldn't stand looking at her anymore. She was so ugly. Oh, dear. Well, what else could I do? I went down to my spinnies and the spas. Yes, I was guilty. The state was more guilty. Because it was them, them who told us to go and take another wife, to increase the numbers of the army. So if I'm guilty, they're more guilty. I always did my duty to the state, whatever you say. When there was a war, I was the first in line and the last to leave. Wake up because I'm thinking. So I put my one foot in. As soon as I did, 
She wakes up and started on me straight away. So I thought no, I was ready for her. I said, Sam Bibi! Sam Bibi! Stop! Stop on her! Tonight, I am the most famous man in the whole of Ellis. She stopped. She smiled. Kissed me and called me darling. <laughs> she hasn't done that in years. <laughs> and boy, did we have a night that night. Oh, it was fantastic. <laughs> And in the morning, she leaned over to me and whispered in my ear, Get out of here, you filthy lady, you know that you need to run past her! Go and get yourself a job! Well, it wasn't always like that. Most of the time, believe it or not, I kept myself to myself. Oh, uh, yes. At the time I used to have the most was the summer months. The glorious season of the poor. Oh, I used to love it. All that heat. It used to make me feel like an elm tree with all the branches stretched out and all the birds, the insects, and this is how it's dancing on my branches. And then when I got too hot, I used to run down to the ocean. My most capricious and unsatisfied lover. And he used to dive in and swim off with the, the, the nymphs and the tritons. And then after that, I used to come on, onto this hot sand and roll around and then lay back on and then let the sun dancing on my belly and all oh, the heat building up into my guns and all that venom and God help anybody, I would bite! So why? Why, 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 oh why do you try me now? In the flowery month of May? Why not in the winter? I wouldn't have minded in the winter. But now I'm so full of venom I can bite you! I can't do this. I have to share with you my philosophy. Oh, no. oh what? I can't. I can't carry on. I suppose you prefer to hear a dirty story, would you? Yeah. Oh. No, oh, I have to share with you. I have to. Socrates has to atone his sins. Oh, baby. The story is in order. Very well. At the time, Theodot, the erotic dancer, tried to seduce me. Somebody, I don't know who, but somebody told Theodot that I didn't like women. Me, not like women. I loved women. Every time I went round to her villa, I used to sit down on her couch. And then she used to lay right next to me, half naked with her bosoms bouncing up and down. <laughs> oh, they were magnificent. <laughs> the times she used to ask me to come round when she was taking a bath or doing one of her erotic dances. <laughs> and then she used to say things like, to me, you don't be my lead name like this, do you, Socrates? Of course, you are an intellectual, aren't you? Mind? <laughs> I didn't mind one bit. <laughs> And then one day, after I had a conversation, she tells me, Socrates, do you know I know 69 different ways of making love? <laughs> and she said, Socrates, what's the matter? So I told her, you see, I was trying to work out which of the 69 ways of making love was the most philosophically absolute. Which one is it? Come on, tell us. Which one? <laughs> Absolute in high or low brow matters either. First of all, I am 
not a philosopher. I did not build temples or create systems. The Delphi gave me a wise man's degree, not a philosopher's one. No, I'm not the, the same as Axigodas. No, I'm more like with Euripides and Sophocles, those two prattling poets. They are the heart and I of the mind. No. No one ever called me Mr. Philosopher. It was always Mr. Teacher or Mr. Chairman. The wisest man of all. That's what the Delphi called me. The man who has all the answers because he professes to know nothing. But I wondered, was I really the wisest? So I used to go around searching, asking people, talking to people to find out. It was all a con. Eh, it was a con. I didn't have all the answers. I merely scratched the surface. You see, it doesn't pay the gods for us mere mortals to know the truth. So they blew dark smoke into your heads and forced you to kill me. Eh, shame really. If I lived a bit longer, I could have discovered the truth. The truth. What is the truth? I used to search for the truth at a very young age. I used to go down to the Amora and listen to all the wise men talk. You know, one day I heard them have 40 different answers to the same question. Yeah? And they all sounded correct. The sophists thought they were right because they always did. Then it got me thinking, what if, what if, if you could actually find an answer to each question and subject? Would that be amazing? So first I thought with my young brain, and later on with my mature one. Where could one find such an answer? It couldn't be in the external world. No, no, it's full of corruption and decay. But no, in the internal world. The soul which is everlasting and pure. But the problem is it's been suppressed over the years. And then covered in this big rusty coat. And the only way that you can get it out is by the help of a midwife. So I became the midwife of the state. So I tried to coax it out slowly with one hand. But if need be, I used to use both hands and both arms to deliver that baby, to help that truth be reborn! But the thing is, I discovered that your whole life is determined before you were born. Everything's just mapped out for you. The schools, in the streets, at work, at home, you're taught, you're taught one of the most specific things. To respect power, because the might is right. It doesn't matter if it's corrupt or not, but they're in charge. Even in the army, you hear them marching around at 17, pounding their chest. Support, the might is right. And when they're released from the army, and they go into city streets, and they go into the marketplace, and they discuss, with the young, the old, yesterday, today, tomorrow. So Paul the right is right. And what if there's a madman on the loose trying to kill one of these politicians? What do we do? We surround them. We protect them. And if by chance the madman jumps over and kills that politician, then what do we do? Go off and get another one. Maybe more corrupt than the last. This, this I deliver from the soul of the herd. And the soul, the soul is living at the height of absolute, dancing with eternity's substance, terrified of being touched by, by the laws of nature and man. Arguments, relativity, corruption. Look, if a, if a soul is stuck in the mud, if a man is stuck in the mud, the soul is not there. No, it's not there. It doesn't feel any pain, no injustice, because it is free, free. That's why I injected all the young people with my philosophy, to protect the young for the future. So why, oh why, do you want to kill me today? You could disagree with my teachings, but you can't disagree with me criticizing public figures. And it's them, they! who condemn me today for atheism. A Socrates mocks the gods and turns their wrath against the state. If broad beans and butter beans are destroyed by the Jew, if a, a house in the state is burned to the ground and all the poor make homeless, if foot and mouth disease kills all the animals, who is to blame? Why, it's the atheist, of course. Who else? Was it my teachings that brought down the plague at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War? Well, funny thing is, I never philosophised in those 
those days. Or maybe it's the Augustine generals that were atheists. The, the, the nemesis rose the waters so we could pick up our ground. And when I quitted the generals, did the heavens open up and pour out boiling oil to score us? No. The gods took pity on the 35 tyrants. So you tell me who is to blame for our ills? You worry about the world deteriorating. Well, which world? The world of the mountains and the skies? Fear not. Get yourself a couple of atheists, pull them to death, and all will be well. <laughs> they're the Vatican's, they're the Athens. All your teachings, written or otherwise, fear of the gods, respect the law, love, bravery, and virtue are all laying in hell next to your stalk and slaves. Oh, corruption. Thievery, bribery, that is the demon state. And that, that is what's got most of you into the positions of power you are today. And then I come down with my philosophical cane, blowing wind into their stomachs, making them stand up with fresh ideas, untouched by time and people's idiosyncrasies for the infinite mind. Talking of minds. Pericles. Remember Pericles? What did he say? He said, the strength and the power of the state it is the salvation of the poor and the wretched. I didn't want to think he was lying to us. And what did he mean by the word state anyway? Eh? Did he mean all of us? Or maybe just some of us? Eh? Maybe just the, the rich, the powerful, the politicians, the clever ones. Because you know, when they eat, our stomachs get full. Mm. When they prosper, we get rich. When they don't get rich, we get poor. And when their possessions are in danger, we lose our sleep. Yeah? Do you get it? No? Ah. Maybe another story. Well, once upon a time, I'll keep it simple. Once upon a time, there was this band of robbers, yeah? This band of robbers went into this town and sucked it dry. Until they realised they had nothing more to take. But one of the robbers had an idea. So they called all the townsfolk into the square. The first thing they said to them was, Hands up everybody, hands up! So they all put their hands up. Do not worry, they said. We will not take your picks and your shovels or your shanty towns. From now on you can keep everything. We won't take them from you. From this day forth, thievery and robbery is outlawed, even for us. You can work and prosper as much as you like. We will teach you how to fight and defend yourself in case we have any foreign invaders. All you have to do is pay us a weekly tax. So, the robbers lived happily ever after in the winter in their castles and in the summer in their mansions. Oh, one of the townspeople. <laughs> they also lived happily ever after in their shanty towns. Men of Athens, men of Athens, I have proved to you over and over again. I have worked for the benefit of the state. I have tried to help you separate the haves and the have nots. Yeah? I have proved to you that the soul is everlasting and lives forever. So therefore the gods, the state, and the laws all exist. Well they must, without the fear of the gods, all our souls will be lost. And we'll end up in prison. Head of Athens, you must understand without the state, the state, what is what good is laws and gods. Yeah? We the miserables, yeah? We, the miserables, must have faith so we can live life everlasting and, have, and be happy. As long as we die first, of course. <laughs> Do not try to take from our masters what they took from us by force and by cunning. Let them keep it, let them have it all. Because they will suffer in the worlds to come while we suffer here today. They will end up in the frying pan of boiling glue in all eternity. But we will.
will not punish them because we will be in the wrong and our souls will be lost. All my teachings weren't empty words and impacts. No! They were a foundation that I was building. It's better to suffer wrong than do wrong. I know it stands strongly on sad, water and weak souls, but the more humble one is, the more indecisive one becomes, the more tired and exhausted one is, the, the less, the more out of breath one is, and you can't think and revolt. It takes courage in yourself to fight injustice, and much more to commit it. You're, you're brought up to be afraid, but you're terrified of being frightened. You're wrapped up in your own world. You don't eat, you don't drink, you don't make love. You don't like the sun, you don't like the sea, you don't like to hear the wind in the forest. You thrive on illness and silence and death just to go to heaven. Pain has demoralized you. I thrive with the joy of pain, so much so, it stands like a, a, like a scarecrow in the crowd. For those who can't stand pain, the laws of Sodom will take care of you. They built temples from mighty Aphrodite, and quite cheaply you can purchase self-perfection. Well, self-forgetfulness, that is. I say the same thing to you differently. Do not punish the wrongdoers, because they do not know what they are doing. Teach them, teach them the difference between vice and virtue. And when they discover the truth, the world will be a magnificent place to live in. Really? And then we build schools. They're built for, built by the wrongdoers. Do you know why? Because it's their money back. And in return, we shall teach the children not to stand up and fight injustice. Men of Athens, I have proved to you today that I have served the state and always towed the line in supporting that the might is right in schools, in the streets, at work, at home, in the newspapers. I have made sure they all work in unison. I have carried the flag and waited to make sure that this happens. Why today, you try me as an atheist. In the future, they will understand. They will see me as a prophet. They will use all my teachings as their moral compass. They will put my face on the side of temples and draw a halo around it. Why today? Today, you give me headlock to drink. Socrates, being weak and poor, is condemned to die. The law is just. The jury is made up of decent, honourable citizens who committed an error. The only guilty ones were the three bad men, the accusers, who ruined this poor fellow.
I'd like to say it's been a pleasure uh, and a privilege to work with, uh, with George and everybody here. Um, to thank Aris and Connor up there. Uh, and Marula, uh, the heart of the Christian Free. Thank you. 